Good evening. Welcome to the John Adams Institute. For me, this is a real vintage John Adams event where we all have this <gasps> exciting feeling of being part of something really special. At least, I feel that way. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the University of Amsterdam for their hospitality. And thank you especially to the publisher of Joseph Stieglitz's book in Dutch, Altenaeum Publishers. And thank you, thank you to our sponsor for this evening, our new main sponsor for the John Adams, to whom we are very grateful, the company Getronics. We really appreciate your making this possible for us. Thank you. Our moderator this evening will be Marika Selinga, whom I'm sure all of you know as um, one of the most prominent female economists in the Netherlands. I don't think that should really matter, but it does. Let's just face it, it does. She is the deputy editor of the newspaper NRC Handelsblad, of course my own newspaper. She has also been a frequent uh, speaker on Buitenhof, where Professor Stieglitz will also be speaking this coming Sunday. And of course her column in the NRC is very well read by anyone interested in economics in the Netherlands. And a special word of welcome to our two guests of honor, Joseph Stieglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, and thank you for writing this book, which has really gotten people thinking about the Euro in a way that I think many of us have not really wanted to. It's confronting us with our own anxieties, our own worries about the future of Europe, the future of our, our uh, gemeenschappelijke munt, and where is it leading us? Yeah. <laughs> Forgive me, <laughs> I've been here too long. <laughs> but I think Stieglitz's book, that's why we're all here, isn't it? We could have sold this hall out twice over. Everyone wanted to be here this evening to hear about where is the Euro taking us and is that really where we want to go? And I also want to say a special word of thanks to our Minister of Finance, Jeroen Dijsselbloem, for accepting the challenge to be here this evening and for not canceling after the interview with Stieglitz in the FD. I was afraid you would. The program this evening is as follows. After my word of welcome, uh, Marika will give her introduction. You can read her introduction as of tomorrow on our site if you want to sit back and reflect on it. I've read it already, it's very good. You probably will want to read it again and reflect on it. Then we will have a presentation by Professor Stiglitz, a response from Minister Dijsselbloem, then there will be a debate among the three of them, and I really hope it's a debate where sparks fly, an un-Dutch kind of debate. So let's have an American debate. <laughs> we'll have a debate. There will also be opportunity for the audience to ask questions, so get thinking about what you would like to know. This is probably your only opportunity. And then I will come back to you at the end of the evening with closing remarks, and Professor Stieglitz will sign books at Ateneum Bookstore. So with no further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Marika Stellinga. Ladies and gentlemen, we made it. Since the financial crisis broke out in 2008, there were many times that we in the Eurozone thought we would not make it when we saw one huge bank after another being rescued by our governments and taxpayers' money, when we saw money fleeing from Southern Europe to Northern Europe, when we saw financial markets in extreme panic and the banking system freezing up, when we discovered that a country like Greece had built up such huge debts that it had to be saved, when other countries like Ireland, Spain and Port Portugal also had a hard time keeping their head above water, when they had to be helped too. When we saw the European leaders and finance ministers lock themselves up in Brussels weekend after weekend, year after year, to agree upon yet another deal to save Europe. When we saw our leaders bicker about what to do while people all over Europe protested in the streets. When we saw the endless soap series of discontent between Europe's leaders and consecutive Greek governments. When we thought, come on, already resolve this dispute. We made it, although we also know that we are not yet on solid ground. 
This week, the German bank Deutsche is the object of doubt about its health. It is a central pillar on which the European banking system rests. Again, we are assured that the panic is not justified. We will see. So far. So far, we made it. And the man sitting there, Mr. Jeroen Dijsselbloem, head of the Eurogroup of finance ministers since January 2013, a group where a lot of decision making in the Eurozone starts, was central to rescuing Europe from crisis after crisis. We made it. Let's heave a huge sigh of relief. Well, not so fast. In come Mr. Joseph Stiglitz. Nobel laureate and world famous economist with his new book about the Europe to tell us that we should not cheer. We only think we made it. The structures that support the Euro are fundamentally flawed. So much so that we will keep on limping from crisis till crisis until something breaks. The euro was meant to bring prosperity and enhance solidarity in Europe. It has done the opposite, Mr. Stieglitz writes. It has made strong countries st stronger and weak countries weaker. The euro undermines the support for the European Union because it creates more divergence and less solidarity between the nations of the eurozone. To save the European Union, maybe, we should sacrifice the euro. But it's not only fundamental flaws that hurt the eurozone since 2008. It is also policies implemented by leaders like Mr. Dijsselbloem. Mr. Stieglitz's book actually is a drawn out review of, among others, Mr. Dijsselbloem's work. Let me summarize the criticism of Mr. Stieglitz in one sentence. Everything Mr. Dijsselbloem and his European colleagues did made us worse off. <laughs> the Eurozone leaders have worsened the fundamental flaws of the Euro by imposing disastrous economic and fiscal policies on the countries of the Eurozone. Policies which Mr. Stieglitz in his book calls neoliberal, Policies that benefit big business and hurt people. Policies that cause high unemployment and in Greece bordered on the inhumane. Policies that were above all economically very stupid. Any economist should have known that extreme austerity, which means a government has to cut spending and raise taxes to get out of debt, would bring economies such as Greece from a recession into a depression. Mr. Stiglitz is right. Countless numbers of economists predicted this. So we made it, but at a huge cost, Mr. Stieglitz argues in his book. The euro has been saved at the cost of a lost decade. Many people have become unemployed or earn depressed wages in Europe. It made the people of Europe drift apart because they can see very clearly that the euro benefits some more than others. And unless we change the rules of the euro, we are doomed. The good news of the book, Mr. Stieglitz has three solutions. One, more Europe. Two, an amicable breakup. Three, a flexible Europe. Euro. The bad news, for many Europeans and politicians, these solutions are the equivalent of a horror movie. More solidarity, transfers of funds from countries that are doing well to countries that are doing poorly, more rules from Europe or a potentially very costly breakup. European politicians would rather muddle through. So how do we move forward? What to do? Let's ask these two very eminent men, both economies, economists, both very passionate about the European project, how we can make it. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And with that introduction, I really don't have to give 
my talk. I think you really summarized everything I had to say uh, much more beautifully and succinctly than I could. So, so thank you, uh, thank you a lot for for that introduction. Um, maybe I and, and thank you for for uh, this, this occasion to talk to you. Maybe I should begin by by saying, you know, uh, uh, a natural question is, what is an American doing talking about the euro? Doesn't America have enough problems of its own? <laughs> and the answer is absolutely we do. Uh, some of those problems are not unrelated to some of the problems I'm going to be talking. We're going to be talking about tonight, uh, but. Uh, there are a couple reasons why I think uh, it's, it's important, uh, why I was interested in writing this book and, and, and why uh, I think any, any, any economist and uh, anybody in the world should be interested in the subject. The first, economists love experiments and we don't get the chance to do many experiments. Uh, and so the euro was a wonderful experiment, a little bit of crazy experiment, but it was an experiment of a group of diverse countries deciding to share a currency and uh, against all odds and seeing what happened. And it was an interesting experiment because some people made predictions about what would happen and others made other predictions and some people so far have proven right and other people have been proven wrong. And I'll come back to who was right and who was wrong, but you'll see that uh, in, a, in, in a minute. Um, there's another more fundamental reason, though, why this is so, uh, why, why an American, why this is so important. And that is because we live in a globalized world and what happens to Europe is going to affect the United States and everybody in the world. And Europe has played a particularly important role in so many of the important issues that I care about and I think that uh, uh, everybody should care about, things like climate change. Uh, they've been on the forefront of dealing with the problems of climate change, dealing with the uh, uh, problem of human rights, dealing with problems of migration. So what worries me is that if Europe is distracted by a failed currency, by a currency system that's not working, and just trying to get your economy to work because of this failed currency, you won't have the energy and the ability, the attention to devote to these much more important issues. So what I want to do um, today, uh, t this evening is to talk a little bit about uh, why it is uh, to try to explain a little bit more detail uh, why it is I thought, think that uh, the euro was really flawed at birth. Now, to understand it, you have to go back in time and uh, put yourself back in 1992, at the time Maastricht Convention was signed and, and the euro was created. It was a particular moment of history. It was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Iron Curtain, it was, we interpreted that as the triumph of a market economy. It wasn't. It was really the failure of communism, a system that couldn't work. But we thought that because the market economy had triumphed, the market economy was invincible and we could just leave everything to the market. It was also after uh, the Latin American crisis and before the East Asia crisis. Uh, Latin American crisis was the beginning of the 80s, uh, the uh, East Asia crisis, 97, 98. Why is that important? Well, the idea oh, that was prevalent at the time, sometimes called neoliberalism, the idea was that as long as government didn't mess up things, as so long as government didn't have too big of a deficit, too big a debt, didn't let inflation get out of control, markets would make everything work well. And so you could trust markets as long as you make sure that government didn't uh, muck up things. So that was the idea. But by 1997, just five years after the Maastricht, 
everybody knew that that idea was wrong. Because in East Asia, you had country after country that had a surplus, not a deficit. You had countries that had no inflation, no significant debt, and one country after another going into crisis. So it was clear that that particular theory was wrong. And yet, when at the time that, that the euro was constructed, they, they, they wanted a, a set of rules that would ensure that this group of divergent, different countries would get similar, more similar. And this was another idea. Back, uh, my colleague, uh, Bob Mundell, uh, wrote a, uh, a very famous paper about what were the conditions under which countries could share a currency. And it was very clear, his, his argument is they had to be similar enough, and it was very clear that the European countries did not satisfy those conditions. And that was why among economists there was a lot of skepticism about, about whether the, Euro, the Eurozone would succeed. Europe recognized that they did not satisfy those conditions. But the hope was that if the countries only obey those conditions, what are called the convergence conditions, the countries would come closer together and eventually they would satisfy those conditions. But there actually was no economic theory that said that those conditions were either necessary or sufficient for bringing about that convergence. And what I'm going to try to describe in a few minutes is to try to illustrate, in fact, what they did is create a system that was divergent. Not unintentionally, they created a structure that rather than bringing the countries together actually led the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. Um, before going into some of the analytics of, 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 of what, uh, why uh, uh, it, the Eurozone was flawed at birth, I want to give you some figures that will show what has happened. And uh, it, was, it was intended to, to bring about prosperity. It was pr intended to promote European solidarity. But there was not enough solidarity at the moment of the creation of the Euro to create the institutions that would ensure the Euro would work. And the hope was that over time those institutions would be created. So there was a, a theory here of political reform. But in fact, as time went on, it didn't bring prosperity. And because it didn't bring prosperity, it brought divergence. And that made the reforms that were necessary more difficult until we are at the point we are today. There are still some people who are optimistic. I w yesterday, last night uh, in New York, we had a, uh, a, night, uh, 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 a night before last night, we had a, uh, a session where we had uh, a number of people, uh, there are actually several books being written about the Euro, and uh, Marcus Brunemeyer is a professor, a German professor at Princeton, and he has a book out, and he was giving what he saw the optimistic view, and that is that there's going to be a really big crisis, and at that big crisis, Europe will come together and solve the problems. Now, that's the optimistic view of, of, <laughs> of, 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 of Europe, uh, and, and, and that's the alternative theory of reform. Well, let me, uh, as I say, uh, it hasn't brought the prosperity that was hoped. That is clear. And let me just... Uh, show some uh, figures that give you um, the picture of where uh, Europe, uh, the Eurozone, uh, is today. What you see is that, that just your, Europe is just getting back to where it was seven years ago. Zero growth for the Eurozone as a whole over a seven-year period. This is remarkable for an advanced country. 
many countries, that's the average, but for many countries, the GDP is lower than it was before the crisis. In fact, for some countries, all right, for some countries, for a number of countries, the downturn was, has been worse than the Great Depression. So sometimes you pe people say, well, it's not so bad here in Netherlands. Uh, yes, that's true, but there are other places in the Eurozone where things are really, really bad. And, you know, the Great Depression stands out as the episode in history where, where things were really, really bad. And in, ma in most of the crisis countries, the downturn is much worse than in the Great Depression. The growth in output, the growth in output per member of the working age population today is significantly lower than before the crisis for European countries. And of course, the aspect that is most worrisome is the high level of unemployment and the even higher level of youth unemployment. And I guess I have good news that the latest numbers from the Eurostat is that Greek youth unemployment has just fallen to 49%. So it finally broke the 50% level. But it's been at this level of over 50% since the beginning of the crisis. And the only reason it's down to 49% is that a lot of the most talented Greek young people have left the country. That's not a growth policy for the future. That's not a policy that is going to lead for a, a strong Greek economy 10 years, 15 years from now. So, uh, one uh, way of, of, of thinking about um, uh, the crisis is to realize that it began in the United States, and typically when crises begin in a country, the country where the crisis began is the country that is the slowest to recover. But here is a picture. Uh, let me go. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so in fact, uh, this is the gap. Uh, what, what, what this curve shows is the trend growth in Europe in the period before the creation of the euro. And there are two, and then I extrapolated on, and there are two things that are significant about that graph. The solid uh, line there uh, is the trend growth. Not, you know, not impressive, but not terrible. Two things stand out about that. First, the creation of the euro did not lead to any burst of economic growth. It's hardly any different. But what you see there is what happened after 2008 crisis. Critics of the euro worry that when there was a crisis, it would be difficult the euro would make it difficult for countries to adjust. And you see the consequence. It was difficult for the countries to adjust. And the contrast between Europe and the United States is, oops. Oh, crap. Well. Oh, here, here it is. So the, the, the contrast it seem very clear in these two charts. On the right-hand side, you see how the United States, it too didn't perform very well in the crisis, but is now closing, is at least the gap is, is not getting larger. Whereas what, on the left-hand side, what you see is how the gap between where Europe would have been and where it is, is continuing to grow very markedly. And I could translate those gaps into real numbers. What we're talking about, that, those gaps add up now to trillions of euros. 
And I don't, you know, I know Netherlands is a rich country, but let me just frame it. Trillions of euros is a lot of money. <laughs> Even if you're relatively wealthy and in a, 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 a nice neighborhood. So uh, what went wrong? Well, the ba the, there's a big debate uh, among economists about uh, what is the fundamental problem. Was it policies or was it structure? Uh, and the basic argument of my book is that it was the structure of the Eurozone. Policies made it worse, but you could have had a genius for policymakers. People like uh, the Minister of Finance, you could have brilliant people, and they were so constrained by the structure of the Eurozone that there is no way they could have made the system work. So that's really the basis of the argument. So there's one school of thought to say, just get rid of those bad guys, the policymakers, get a new guy, a group of in, and go forward. And what I'm, the thesis of the book is that's not enough. <laughs> that, that you have to change, <laughs> that you, 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 you need to change the, 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 the rules of the game. You need to change the structure of the Eurozone. So what is the basic uh, uh, argument? Well, when you create a single currency, you take away the, the uh, two major instruments of adjustment, the exchange rate and the interest rate. Ways by which an economy, when it has an adverse shock, can respond. And unfortunately, they didn't put anything in place. Instead, instead of doing that, they tied the hands of Europe by saying you can't have more than a 3% deficit. So when I was chairman of the Council, uh, a member of the Council of Economic Advisors of President Clinton, there were people who wanted to put forward a fiscal constraint, uh, a budget, a, 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 a amendment to the Constitution of the United States that would limit our deficit. And we said, no way. We said, yes, we were very responsible and we were actually winding up with a surplus. But we knew that there was a possibility of an economic downturn like we had in 2008. And we did not want to have the hands of government tied to having a, uh, a balanced budget. So, but what Europe did is it tied the hands in the theory that, going back to what I said before, in the theory that if you just had a limited deficits, limited debt, no inflation, the economy would work well. But that theory was obviously wrong, it should have been wrong, known to be wrong by the time of the East Asia crisis. But by the time of the financial crisis in Europe, Ireland and Spain had actually a surplus. And yet they were among the countries that experienced the biggest downturn. It was the crisis that caused their deficit, not the other way around. And thinking that therefore, by limiting the deficit, you would prevent a crisis was simply not the right diagnosis. And if you have the wrong diagnosis, you're not gonna get the right prescriptions. But actually things were worse than that. Not only did they take away uh, 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 the mechanisms of adjustment, as I said before, they created a diverging system. And let me try to explain simply how they created this diverging system. Um, I'll, I'll only have time to talk about one aspect, the financial system. The, behind any country's banks lie the government. Go back to 2008, the financial, global financial crisis that began in the United States. In 2008, late 2008, 2009, where did money go? Money left Europe and all over the world, and it went to the United States. Was it going to the United States because our financial system, our banks had proven themselves 
experts in managing risk? That was a rhetorical question. (laughs) No, they had just shown that they didn't know how to manage risk. Our government had shown they didn't know how to manage the, the banks to make sure, to supervise the banks to make sure that they knew how to manage risk. And yet money came to the United States. Why was it coming there? Well, it was a simple reason. Right after Lehman Brothers collapsed in September uh, of 2008, uh, I was on a phone call uh, of what would be the Democratic Party response. Obama was the nominee for the president. Uh, Bush had put forward a bill for a $700 billion bailout of the banks. And the question was, what should the Democratic Party respond? Well, how should the nominee uh, candidate Obama respond to this proposal? And most of the people on the conference call were bankers. And their first reaction was, why only $700 billion? (laughs) And the answer was, because a trillion dollars sounded too big. But don't worry, if you need more, we can double it, triple it, don't worry. And so it was an attempt to calm down the bankers and to say, don't, you know, Wall Street, uh, you know, our U.S. Treasury is a wholly owned subsidiary of Wall Street, and if you needed more money, you would get it. Well, uh, that was why money was coming to the United States. We had the resources in the United States and we had shown the ability of the government to stand behind the banks and that gave confidence. But think about now, switch back to Europe, you have your money in a Spanish bank and the Spanish government is weak and the Spanish banks are weak. Do you have confidence that the Spanish government is going to bail out and be able to bail out the Spanish banks? Obviously not. And what are you going to do? You're going to try to take your money out, take it to someplace else where The government is stronger and hopefully the banks are stronger. You don't know that because as we all know now, it's it's quite remarkable. This is a little bit of an aside. You're talking about one of the largest banks in the world and the debate is will a fine from the US government push that bank over the cliff? In fact, they're talking about will a fine half that size push them over the cliff, or three quarters the size, push them over the cliff. If banks are that fragile, that says something. And it says something about the confidence of the markets in European regulatory system to say that they don't believe that there's that much comfort in their oversight. Well, anyway, that was an aside. But the, 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 um, uh, it's, it's clear that with the country expected to bail out each bank, uh, its own country's banks, money is going to leave weak countries and go to the strong. And as money leaves the weak countries, what can the banks in those weak countries do? They have to start contracting their lending. And as they start contracting their lending, the country gets even weaker. And you have this private sector financial contraction augmenting public austerity, bringing the economy down. And it's actually that is one of the reasons why the Troika estimates were so bad time after time after time. They thought the recovery was going to be around the corner and then it didn't come. And so they said, oh, well, it's around the next corner and it didn't come. And then they said, it's around the next corner, and it didn't come. And one of the reasons for that consistent mistake in that forecasting was they didn't take into account this financial sector multiplier, this financial sector augmentation of the adverse effects of austerity that were really uh, weakening these economies. Well, the result of all this is, is so forcefully explained, Europe created a diverging system where the weak countries got weaker, the strong countries got stronger. And there are many other details in the design of the system that led to this divergence. Uh, Easy way to solve it 
easy institutional arrangements that could have solved this, common deposit insurance. With common deposit insurance, you didn't have to pull your money out of Spain simply because you thought the Spanish banks were weaker. But they didn't have that common deposit insurance as part of the original structure. And while they've agreed on a banking union, the idea of a common deposit insurance has been put off to some time in the future. While the common deposit insurance is the critical issue here to prevent the financial sector divergence that I just described. But there are many other forces leading to this divergence in the structure that I just described. Well, I want to move on because uh, I want to keep uh, time for our discussion. It's not a debate, it's a discussion. And uh, it's not meant, uh, we hope to shed light, not heat, on, on the subject. Uh, so uh, I hope that's uh, what, what we'll, we'll do in the uh, discussion that follows. Um, the, the policies, uh, the structure was, was uh, flawed but the policies made things even worse. And the policies, first of austerity, I explained why I thought you know, before, austerity is not a growth policy. I remember in 2010, um, the, uh, 2011, I'm sorry, you know, the austerity began being imposed on Greece in 2010 with the crisis, and by 2011, it was already clear that it was not working, that it was causing the country to go down. The debt-GDP ratio was going up. They were worried about debt sustainability, and debt sustainability is described by looking at the ratio of debt to GDP. But there are two ways of affecting the debt-GDP. One to reduce the debt, and the other one is, one is to change the numerator, and the other is to change the denominator. And they kept focusing on the numerator, and as they focused on the numerator, they were making the denominator smaller and smaller. So the debt-GDP ratio actually grew. It started at 110%, and then after the Eurozone, Euro programs, the debt-GDP ratio got larger and larger, and then they finally restructured the debt, and it came down, and then they kept pushing austerity, and the debt-GDP ratio kept growing because the GDP kept shrinking to the point where today the IMF is forecasting the debt-GDP ratio will go over 200%, and they're going to need another debt restructuring just to get back to where they were back in 2010. So... It was very clear by 2011, austerity was not working. And they had a Eurozone meeting, and I remember Papandreou coming back, and hopeful, hopeful that they had agreed on some element of a growth strategy to complement austerity. But that growth strategy never came. There was never a strategy to complement, and so the economy continued to shriek shrink until it's now more than 25% below what it was. And just for those of you who thought you solved the Greek problem a year ago, the depression has continued and probably gotten worse. Why? Another dose of austerity has had exactly the predictable effect. So that's the austerity. That's the one aspect of the policy uh, that's been most subject to criticism. The other is the structural reforms, the change in the uh, structure of the economy. Not everybody needs, every economy needs a structural uh, reform. The United States economy needs lots of structural reforms. Economies that have poor structures have lower standards of living. But that doesn't mean you have to have 49% youth unemployment. It doesn't mean you have to have a depression. What it means is that your citizens suffer from lower standards of living, and hopefully that will be a part of the democratic process that will demand the structural reforms from within the country. But in the case of the Eurozone, they focused, you know, my view is the, the, structural, pro, the structural issues are the structure of the Eurozone itself. That's the structure that needs to be reformed. But the structural issues that we're focused on, say in the case of Greece, 
were not the key problems. And this is a fundamental issue. When you have country, somebody from one country going to another country, imposing structural reforms, it's very likely you're not gonna get the right reforms. And I can say this from having been at the World Bank because we did it all the time. <laughs> and that was what we called conditionality. And in general, it didn't work. And finally, uh, the World Bank is beginning and the IMF beginning to realize this. But, you know, we, we at, at the World Bank and World IMF, they did it over and over again. What, found, what I found so striking is that after seeing how badly these conditionality structural reform did, it was one thing for the IMF and the World Bank to impose this on developing countries and emerging markets in Asia and Africa and Latin America, but for Europe to do it on itself seemed really strange. Um, put another way, I understand sadism, I don't understand masochism. And, and that was what uh, seems to have been going on here. Well, let me just give you one example of the flaws in the structural reforms that, uh, you know, Greece is burning, Greece's GDP is going down by 25%. And what is one of the structural reforms on which they're discussing? They're talking about how many days old milk can be and still be called fresh. Greece believes that four day old fresh milk should be fresh and the Troika is insisting that it should be 10 day old milk. And you say, how can that help solve the fundamental problems of Greece? In fact, we know something about what was going on, we think. That is to say, some people wanted to ship milk from one country to another, and it takes a number of days. Uh, one of my Italian friends says, if it takes 10 days, it's probably yogurt by the time it gets there, and not milk. But uh, uh, the point is that if that milk competes with Greek milk, what does that mean? A bigger current account deficit for Greece? More unemployment for Greece, a weaker Greek economy. It doesn't help Greece, it helps somebody else. Well, uh, that brings me to the final part of my talk and I've already uh, overspent my time and the good news is you've already explained the last part. The choices are just very clear. You know, it's very, uh, what I try to argue is either there needs to be more Europe or less Europe that the halfway house, the current halfway house, is not sustainable. And what I try to argue is it'd be a lot better to go towards the more euro, and you put it very clearly that uh, you hear lots of voices explaining why that's so difficult. Um, and what I try to do then and explain in the book is how you could manage going to a more flexible arrangement uh, of various kinds that will be, I don't want to say costless, but how you can minimize the cost of that transition. Remember, muddling through has a cost. These depressions have a cost. And it may not be felt so strongly here, but in the countries that are experiencing the recessions, the depression, those costs are very palpable, are going to be very long-lived. Uh, so let me just end on, on, uh, on a note of, uh, of hope that uh, one of the reasons that I, I wrote the book is to make perhaps more clear the stark choices that Europe faces in the hope that they will choose uh, the direction of more Europe as, as difficult as that may be, rather than these other alternatives that can be managed, but are, in my mind, very much the second best alternative. Thank you. Um, wow. 
Um, I've had uh, smaller challenges in my life <laughs> than this one after speaking after Professor Stiglitz, um, a renowned economist, uh, and on the basis of this book, I thought the book was still up there, um, and that is a huge challenge. Yet I want to do that because I feel that we need to get the analysis right. So I will say something about the analysis of our problems in the Eurozone and Eurozone countries. We need to acknowledge the mistakes that were made. So I will acknowledge mistakes that were made in dealing with the crisis. Uh, and we need to have a fair uh, analysis of where we are now. Because a lot of work has already been done. A lot of countries are in a different state. And even Greece, I will argue later on, is on its way back. So that's how I'd like to do that, and I'll try to um, uh, uh, reach the, the standards that you, uh, you've put the, the, the standard here. So I have a long way to go tonight. So I think it's uh, sensible if we go back to the start of the Euro, we need to acknowledge that it was a political product project, and that's very true. And many economists warned for the risks that would come from that political choice, however much as a politician I can understand that political choice at that time, it came from a strong sense in that period after the fall of the wall of uniting Europe, strengthening the political cooperation, unifying Europe even more, and so I can understand the political reasons in that historical context, but it was an economic risk. Certainly if you take into account the differences between the countries at that time, as you pointed out. Um, then if you look at the start of the Euro, and I think it's important to look at the period between the start of the Euro and the start of the crisis. What actually happened? Because if you enter a, a monetary union, a currency union, you lose, as Professor Stiglitz quite rightly said, some of the key uh, economic instruments. It doesn't mean that your hands are tied. You still have a lot of instruments, and certainly in those periods we didn't talk about austerity. So there were lots of different policy options to deal with the divergence in economies. Economies were in a different phase. Um, there were lots of different policy options at national level to sort out some of the st uh, structural issues and to deal with the building up of major risks in some of our economies. This is in the period before the crisis triggered by the financial crisis actually started. So growth before 2008 in the Eurozone in many countries was debt-driven. Uh, there was cheap capital available, which partly had to do with the Euro, uh, leading to cheap credit in many countries and excessive risks. Um, that money was not used in a very productive way, so a lot of investments were not in productive sectors, and a lot of money was not used to invest, but was simply consumed, it was spent households for consumption purposes. Um, not spending money on uh, productive sectors, but spending money in, for example, building up of real estate bubbles, housing sectors. And this was happening in a, lots of different places in Europe. Cheap money leading to excessive risks, non-productive investments. And markets did not recognize the risks. So there was no differentiation in interest levels showing the different risks that were building up in our economies in that period. Interest rates converged, while at the same time, unit labor costs uh, diverged. In Germany, you have to realize that in 2000, the economists called Germany the sick man of Europe. Uh, and they were. they were. Their economy was in a bad state. They were, uh, unit labor costs was very high, and for a period of almost 10 years, unit labor costs stayed absolutely stable in Germany. Well, at the same time, in that very same period, in Greece, unit labor costs shot up by 40% between 2000 and 2010. Imports also shot up. Household spending went up 100% in Greece. Credit to the private sector from 40% of GDP in 2000 to 120% of GDP in 2011. And the deficit we found out later, went from minus four to minus 15 in 2010. So 
there was a convergence of interest rates, but a di divergence of competitiveness. Um, and a lot of this has to do with sound national policies or the lack of sound national policies at national level. The boom bust cycle in Spain, in Ireland, and to some extent also in the Netherlands, the lack of sound supervision, the lack of sound standards for our banks. It was a period of deregulation in our banks and risks were building up also from that perspective. Professor Stiglitz, for many of the problems that build up in that period, blames the euro, and I don't think that is fair to say. I think we need to make a deeper analysis. Um, an interesting angle to take is to see whether non-euro countries develop very differently. For example, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, and Professor Stiglitz in the book makes the point that Sweden has done so much better. And they have had more growth uh, since the crisis, but Denmark has performed below Eurozone average. Norway is on Eurozone average in terms of growth. Finland, a Eurozone country, performed quite well, like Sweden, until the last couple of years when they had very specific national shocks in their economy. Um, did Sweden do relatively well because they were able to depreciate the krone? They could have done, but in fact, they appreciated the krone compared to the euro between 2009 and 2011. And notwithstanding that appreciation, they economically did better. So what's different about Sweden? Again here, if we look at Sweden, they deregulated the final sector, the financial sector in the 80s, had a, had a housing crisis, massive bubbles building up, uh, debt building up in households and had a major banking crisis, but all of this happened earlier. Exactly the same boom-bust financial sector problems. It happened in the 90s, the beginning of 90s. And after that in Sweden, they introduced very prudent policies, very prudent national policies, sorting out the banks, having sustainable growth rather than the boom-bust cycle, and I think that very much explains what happened in Sweden. Um, and here again, you see that national policies really matter. Uh, credit to households in Sweden in 2008, at the beginning of the crisis, was 70% of GDP, where in the Netherlands it was close to 120% over indebted households in the Netherlands, and we know what the effects of that was. Another example interesting to look at is uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, two quite similar countries, similar in many ways, similar uh, economies. The Czech Republic is outside the Eurozone and Slovakia became a member since 2009. The Slovaks have had higher growth than their neighbors. So just the Euro simply doesn't tell the whole story. Now what's happened since the start of the crisis? Uh, here we have to be absolutely clear, the monetary union was not finished, it was not prepared, its institutions were weak, and in some respects, there were no institutions. Um, there was no crisis framework. The budgetary or fiscal framework was very weak, as we found out. And there was no common framework or supervision of our banks. And Professor Stigley quite rightly described what then happens in a crisis, how money starts to flow, and how banks draw down the sovereign, creating the sovereign debts. Uh, many of these issues have been dealt with now. Uh, it took time, it took too long, absolutely, but have been dealt with. A crisis framework was set up, first improvised, later on established as the ESM, a very solid and strong crisis instrument. Fiscal rules were strengthened and implemented. Um, yes, a lot of emphasis was put on deficits, and the key reason for that was that a number of countries simply lost access to financial markets. And they had to turn to European funds to get f financed. But that's not a sustainable model. So countries need to sort out their budgets. It was, by the way, done in a very gradual manner. So the whole idea of austerity is being thrashed through countries. To give you an example of the Netherlands, we, uh, our deficit went from we had a surplus before the crisis of about half a percent. 
it went within one year to a deficit of minus five and a half, and now we've taken eight years to gradually bring it back. And that happened in a lot of countries. For many countries, there was no other option. They had lost access to financial markets and need to uh, regain that trust. Yes, too little emphasis was put on structural uh, adjustments in countries, and some of the reforms were ill-designed, and the order was not always the best order to do things. One of the main things that went wrong was that the banking crisis in Europe dragged on. I think looking back at the crisis, uh, one of the biggest differences between the reaction of the US and Europe was how we dealt with banks. Um, to give you just one example of Ireland, uh, Ireland had a, like a number of European countries, a oversized financial sector, also triggered by the boom-bust cycle in the building sector in Ireland. The Irish banks were bailed out by the government and the national debt increased from 25% before the crisis to 120% in 2013. causing major problems for national governments, uh, part of which uh, was reflected in uh, uh, expenditure cuts to bring down deficits and debt. The same happened in the UK, a non-euro country, I need not explain. Also here, banks had to be saved big time, lots of taxpayers' money, and that process has not been reversed. In the Netherlands, in Spain, and in Greece, banks were bailed out in the same way, which is not the right way to do it. We did not force our banks to recapitalize on the markets. The only good thing in that period was DGCOM, part of the European Commission, forcing us to restructure at least the banks that we saved. That wasn't very popular, not in the Netherlands and not in other countries, but it was a sound way to do it. If a bank needs to be nationalized and saved, then certainly it needs to be restructured and sorted out. So let's focus a little more, if I have more time left, on Greece. What went wrong? I think uh, Professor Stiglitz uh, could have said a little more about the issues in Greece itself. Greece is not just a victim. The Germans are not just the bad guys. Sometimes they are. <laughs> but that is an oversimplification. If you look at Greece, there were decades of bad policies, overcrediting, fiscal fraud, oligarchs, corruption, and a very, very weak, to put it mildly, political system. The first and the second program, with hindsight, it should have been about debt restructuring, uh, both the sovereign debts and, and the banks. The way, but that is also saying it now with hindsight. The politicians then in charge were in the, in the, in the midst of a hurricane, financial sector, uh, financial markets were all over the place. Uh, there was a very strong feeling that the whole Eurozone would collapse, that all of our countries, one by one, would lose access to financial markets. The, the discussion then was about Italy, not about Greece. That was the concern. And in that difficult context, the political leaders of that moment decided not to do a debt restructuring, not to do a bail-in in the banks. So it's easy for me to say now that's a mistake. That left some of the countries with a major debt, but it's still true. So one of my key priorities has been to establish that banking union, to have that bail-in principle, and to make sure that in the future we will have sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms to make sure that the bill of excessive risk-taking is paid by those who claim to be professionals. So let me quickly uh, turn to the future and how to get out of this. What more do we need to do? Um, after improvising at the start, new instruments were developed, new frameworks were developed. There is more Europe in that sense now than there was at the beginning. We have many structural issues have been dealt with, both at national and European level. One of the key ones being the banking union. I very much agree it needs to be finished. It needs to be completed also with a common deposit guarantee system and more of the risks in the different banks need to be sorted out. Europe really needs to deal with their banks. We've made a lot of progress there, started much too late, and we need to finish it. Also, we need to 
continue uh, our structural policies at European level. I think the Juncker plan is a welcome initiative. It will be expanded. It needs to support growth. So when Professor Stiglitz talks about a growth plan, I think we should invest much more in that, invest also much more in education and science to create more growth potential in Europe. Our potential is too low at the moment. We should set up a capital markets union, improve our shock resilience, uh, so a lot more work to do to strengthen that monetary union and make it more shock resilient. One last word, if I may. I think the key issue at the moment in Europe is called populism. This is not exclusively Eurozone. It's not exclusive Europe. You are from the US. I follow the American presidential campaign closely. I think many Dutch do. Uh, and the comparison, the comparability of the kind of debate, the unease, the anger, uh, is very much the same. And I think it's about fairness, I think it's about inequality, a lack of opportunities. Um, and I think we, sort, we should sort that out, and learn from each other and do that together, rather than blaming just one currency in one region. This is on? Yeah. Okay, so we only have 30 minutes and so many questions. I will start with a couple myself and please, if you want to ask a question, a question contains one or two sentences. It's not a speech. Um, so raise your hand and we'll give you the floor. Um, Mr. Stiglitz, first uh, a reaction from you to uh, what Mr. Dijsselbloem said. Uh, the United States also has populism. It's not exclusively European. It was the banks and how they were handled that made the difference between the United States and how they did after the crisis in Europe. Yeah, well, uh, let me make it clear that I'm, I'm not blaming everything on the Euro. And you're absolutely right that national policies are very important. And among those national policies are uh, how you handle the bank uh, restructuring. Uh, it, it's worth noting in the case of Ireland that he pointed out, there was an enormous amount of pressure from the ECB for Ireland uh, government to, uh, to bear that debt restructuring burden. And uh, in, in a secret documents that have only got revealed later, and that's another aspect that I didn't get a chance to talk about is some of the non-democratic and, and, and non-transparent non aspects of, of the way in which uh, some of all of this uh, uh, was, con was conducted. Um, the, um, uh, as I say, the, the, there, there are, are many factors that contributed to the problems that I described. On average, the Eurozone countries have done worse, and I believe that that and this is go you know that the fundamental uh, limitations of the ability to adjust in the face of a shock puts a basic impediment. So yes, some countries manage that; they were lucky. There are sometimes positive shocks that uh, offset the negative shocks, and sometimes governments do wonders. Uh, so, yes, there's going to be a variety of experiences, but on average, they have done more poorly. And let me go, say just one more remark, that I agree very much that there has been progress made in, in attacking some of the very, you know, difficult problems. Um, but the list of things that are necessary, uh, you know, so that's a, a note of optimism. Next says there are a number of other things that need to be done, like quickly fixing, uh, getting a common deposit insurance, uh, creating a common unemployment insurance, so that the countries that are experiencing a large, uh, high level of unemployment don't have to drain the budget to finance the unemployed. Uh, there are not, you know, euro bonds, so you have some degree of mutualization, uh, 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 common resolution, 
So there are a number of, of, the, of these other things that, that have to be done if the euro is going to work. I think that that can be done. But as you said in your remarks, uh, when you start talking about a number of these, you start hearing from many capitals uh, a lot of resistance. Mr. Dijsbloem, do you agree that these things have to be done? I do. Can I just... Uh, I do. Uh, can I just go back to Ireland? Ireland is in interesting because Professor Stiglitz is absolutely right. What happened there was that a number of large European countries from the continent and the ECB told Ireland they cannot do a bail-in. In other words, they would have to take the burden, the problems from the banks and put them on the balance sheet of the state, leaving them with a massive debt. And it was a huge mistake. And still today, I sometimes have to debate, debate with central bankers who keep saying bail-in is dangerous. And I will say to them, bail-in is only dangerous if you central bankers keep saying it's dangerous. It will only work if you central bankers start saying that fundamentally it's the right approach. Because it says to investors, look, you guys invest your money in financial institutions, you take out the profit in the good years, you will carry the losses if things go wrong. That's the only way to make them start managing the risks. And Professor Siglich quite rightly said that's one of the fundamental things that went wrong. Can we I ask one manage. question? Because I agree with you. And you made one other sentence uh, following that that I thought was very interesting, that the professionals who know how to manage money and are getting the returns ought to bear the consequences of their decisions. How do you react to the issue being posed in Italy where non-professionals were sold bonds as if they were certificates of deposit. So you have a rule that works in general, but now you have a situation where you have a country where because of a, a failure of supervision of the bank supervisors, uh, uh, that, that, that the spirit of that rule was violated. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest mistake we can make is because of this legacy issue, which I think needs to be addressed specifically. It's a social issue. Uh, that the biggest mistake would be let's to, let's say let's move away again from the right principle, and start bailing out the banks again. The right principle is to do the bail-in if there are if if there has been massive mis-selling, which in some Italian banks has taken place. They've sold bank bonds to pensioners. So if you do a bail-in, those pensions will be wiped out. So the Italian government should be allowed to have a social program to compensate these people, specifically, personally, to make sure that it doesn't go to the wrong people, not to the investors, but only to pensioners. But don't let this hamper again the right approach for our banks. I'm really worried about this, of course, because... Do you think that's a good solution? Because you're I also critical of Cyprus. This was actually one of the first deeds of Mr. Dijsselbloem in but, the Eurozone. But, but the issue, that, you know, the question is whether depositors who believe they had deposit insurance should be deprived of that deposit insurance. In Cyprus, there was a special set of issues about who those depositors were, but uh, it, it is still the case that they believe they had deposit insurance and, and, and if you, you know, have a rule of law, you, you create that deposit insurance and, and violating that is a problem. But Cyprus was, um, every case is of course different, but Cyprus was an interesting case because for the first time we took a different approach. We said, okay, what's the size of this economy even after the major bank restructuring which would have to take place? What is the size for this island economy? how much can we um, leave them with in terms of sovereign debt? So we took a completely different approach. So then we said, well, uh, the, the program can at a max be 10 billion. We could offer them a major banking program of 40 billion, but it would be on their sovereign debt. So we took a different approach and that led us to the conclusion, the only way to make sure that this country doesn't end up with a huge uh, sovereign debt is to make sure that the big uh, investors and also the big deposit holders get hit. Now in Cyprus, yes, people were told that they had a deposit guarantee system, but there was nothing. There was no fund, no system, no regulation, and if you have an oversized banking system and it collapses, 
then you have promised the deposit holders a protection which is simply not there. So two things to do, sort out this national problem, legacy issues, get it right, and then make sure that they are in a banking union with a deposit guarantee system so that in the future they really have an insurance. In Cyprus there was nothing. And so you also agree that there has to be common unemployment insurance in Europe? Um, I think that's more difficult for many reasons, politically of course, obviously, but also economically. Um, you have to realize that the labor market in Europe is very different. Structural unemployment in a country like Spain is very much higher than in the north. So you would have to distinguish between cyclical unemployment and structural unemployment because otherwise you would simply pay the inefficiencies of the labor market in Spain and that would not be the right uh, incentive. So it is economically very difficult. It, the assumption is that um, the economic shocks in different countries are asymmetrical and if you look at the economies in Europe there have been very few asymmetrical shocks. Um, so I'm not sure at what point we could introduce that, at what point it would come into effect, unless you want it to be also ad address the structural unemployment, but that so, will be very So I, I think you can separate out the cyclical and structural, I mean, the standard ways of doing it. And I think that, uh, you know, to go back, why, you know, one of the issues is how can 50 diverse stakes in the United States share a common currency and what, what makes it work. And I think one of the things that makes it work is that we have common deposit insurance, we have common resolution, and we also have, when we have a very major economic downturn, we, you know, for, for where you have these big cyclical effects, we have common, uh, we, we have, the federal government picks up the burden of the uh, cyclical increase in the unemployment uh, cost. If you didn't do that, you would have the weaker stakes getting weaker because they can't invest in infrastructure, they can't invest in education because they're just paying the unemployment insurance and that makes them still weaker and that leads to a diverging system. So in my mind, yeah, uh, you know, I, I know it's difficult, but, but the answer is unless you're going to do things like that, you're, you're going to get divergence. Can yes. I say one more thing? Yeah. Having unemployment insurance provided by Europe would be one of the most unifying things for Europe. You know, it would... Not, not in all countries. Well... <laughs> no, but this is the heart of the but problem. You say it's difficult, but is it necessary? Do you agree with the analysis that it's necessary? No, I think that if you look at the US, if there are economic shocks in different parts of the US, the main buffering of that shock takes place through markets. And I'm not a market believer, so I don't believe every solution comes from markets, but if you look at how the US economy works, capital markets, labor markets, etc., they absorb a large part of that shock. So there is a lot of profit, no, profit is the wrong word in this sense, um, um, we can, make a lot of pro pro yeah. we can make a lot of progress in this field yeah. in Europe. For example, this is the idea about the capital markets union. If only capital would be more available across border also for our companies uh, and not so bank dependent, the capital market can absorb a lot more uh, economic shocks. The same would go for the labor market, which is becoming more and more open. You can frame that negatively and say, are these unemployment from Spain uh, are only going to Germany because Spain is in such a terrible state. You can also say that the, uh, the labor markets of Europe are becoming more and more open and that people are moving more and more around to find work, which in the US is much more normal. In the US people find that normal. It's, for Europe it's new, but that's also a way to buffer regional economic shocks. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of buffering, but even in the United States with our integrated capital market, integrated labor market, we feel like we need federal government to absorb the cyclical vo volatility in unemployment if we're not going to get divergence across the states. So we think of that as an essential part of making our single currency system work.
And the reality is that it will be a long time between, before European labor markets or capital markets are anywhere near as unified. And that even with unified capital markets, if you look in the United States, you still see very large effects of regional shocks to banking systems. So you're not going to get rid of a, a hit to the Spanish banking system, at, which will be worse unless you remedy it in a, in a uh, more specific way. So, so I think you know, it's, it's, if, if, you, if you really think in this century you want the euro to work, I think you're going to need to have uh, not you know, even stronger institutions than the United States because your markets are not going to be working as smoothly for a very long time as the United States. And, and, and even we with our well-functioning markets. Well, so I, I, I'm nodding my head because, you know, it took the United States, I don't know, I think about 120 years to build the Fed. But in Europe, we built the banking union in three years. So my assumption is that <laughs> if we build... If we build the banking union in three years, we should be able to build a capital markets union in five, so let's try that. Let's finish the banking union, because Professor Stiglitz is right, that uh, um, asymmetric shocks do occur uh, in Europe, very much in the banking system. And then it would be very useful if everyone does apply the same rules and standards and supervision uh, to have shock absorbing mechanisms specifically for the banking system, and that's exactly what yeah. the banking but, union but do you is. agree with the fundamental point in Mr. Stieglitz's analysis that there has to be, I call it solidarity money at the European level. You have to have money to get the weak countries moving again, to invest or to uh, absorb yeah. labor, unemployment or something. Do you agree with that? Um, I think, first of all, that just thinking that it's about more public money flowing from the center or from the north to the south will fundamentally not solve the problems. Not politically, for sure, no, will create clear. more political problems in part of Europe, but also not economically. So it needs to be about the structural adjustments that really are needed in a country like Greece. We cannot think that just money from Europe will help Greece. It needs to be dealt with. We need to build the banking union. We need to restart the convergence machine. And yes, in the future, I think, to complete it, a common Euro European uh, unemployment reinsurance system could be envisaged. If you would introduce it now, it would blow up uh, the okay, Eurozone but it's, uh, uh, for economic and political reasons. It would require more convergence. We are very far apart, and at the yeah. moment, I don't think economically it would be very sound. So, you know, let me cl clear that, that uh, a solidarity fund for stabilization or you know, some counter-cyclical policy is not going to solve everything, and I don't think anybody's pretending. The question is, there are already inherent processes of divergence. I describe a couple of them in the book. There are some others uh, going on. And that even in the well-functioning economies, they remain, these processes of divergence remain. And so the question is, just a, a, is it necessary if the euro is going to work, the eurozone is going to work as a, a zone and not have overall divergence on top of whatever else is going on, that there me, needs to be some additional solidarity. It's not going to solve it. It's not going to bring them together overnight. It's not going to solve a lot of other problems. And I, you know, that's not the issue here. The question is, are you going to help prevent something moving further apart, as has happened since 2007? Okay, I want to move to Greece, because you're very critical in your book about uh, the policies that were forced upon Greece. Um, you say they are neoliberal, they had a hidden agenda uh, of making government smaller. Uh, they even were, you, you talked about the milk and the fresh labels on it, were designed to help uh, European businesses like Campina sell their milk in uh, Greece. Um, can I, and can I say something they were about bordering milk? on the inhumane. Yes, please. I, I, <laughs> We don't, the, the, the Netherlands doesn't play a major a role in the book, for, but, but for those of you who've read it, there is a piece uh, which describes the, the reform of the milk market, and I would be the first to say that that wasn't the most important reform. 
But the interesting part is that Professor Stiglitz writes that it was the Dutch milk industry uh, who wanted to expe export more fresh milk to uh, Greece that was behind this mischievous plan. Now, let me at least very much disagree on this issue. Uh, the Dutch company, I, I think you even mentioned it, the Dutch company that is actually active in Greece does not export fresh milk, hasn't done in the past, and hasn't done since the reform. Uh, there is no fresh milk export from the Netherlands or from most European countries to Greece. It's a reform, and it's a small one, I'll give you that. It's a small reform that deals with uh, having more milk tradable within Greece. Uh, and Greece has extremely high milk prices. Now, I will say that the Dutch milk prices are extremely low, so we shouldn't compare it to the Netherlands, but compared to the EU average, they are also very high, and it's because tra trade in something as simple as milk in Greece is very regulated, very difficult. But I'll be the first to admit it wasn't the key reform, so don't please hang me, don't hang me on that. <laughs> Uh, but the Dutch company has no fresh milk in Greece. Okay, so let's clear. get that right, get that straighted out. But do you agree with Mr. Stieglitz that we have been extremely harsh upon Greece? It borders um, the inhumane, he says. It has been extremely hard, you, but uh, this, is a, this is true. And, Can I and, give a and, defense and, a little bit? And, I'll give a little bit of defense and, and, while well, you're struggling. And, and, <laughs> uh, even... You know, even... I thought you said a discussion, not a, a debate. A, okay. No, no, a defense of you. I, I, that, that even in the, the absence uh, uh, of any austerity, Greece could not have funded its deficits because nobody was willing, willing to lend. So Greece would have had to face austerity anyway. So the real criticism is not so much that it had austerity. The real criticism is that they didn't come with enough assistance to promote growth, for instance, from the European Investment Bank, from some other way. The decrease in the, the um, uh, primary deficit in Greece from about, uh, I think it was 15% of GDP to a surplus that was demanded of 4%, 3.5%, or in fact, at one point it was 6%, was an incredible change that no country has ever accomplished. They managed from minus 15% to zero in about four years. That was one of the largest achievements ever. And to say that they didn't do anything, I think, is, is a little harsh. I think it was a very big achievement, but... The fact is that with that con contraction, there was inevitably going to be a depression unless Europe came to the assistance with some form of growth assistance yeah. like from the European Investment Bank. Um, you have to realize that the, the starting situation in Greece on many, many issues was terrible and only a few had to do with uh, the euro the availability of European structural funds for Greece was quite huge, but these funds were never absorbed. They weren't used by Greece. So the Commission has been helping Greece to absorb the funds from the center, solidarity to support Greece, to get projects off the ground to get those going. But over the years of the crisis, a lot of money from structural funds that was meant for Greece was never uh, used. It's also a matter of organization. It's a matter of functioning of the government. It's a matter of functioning of the tax system. Yes, if you have a deficit of 15%, austerity is inevitable. But another way to approach it, it would to have a fair tax system, an effective tax system. Um, many European countries have tried to help Greece build it up, but it has been extremely difficult. Yeah. Can I just even Greece is not a victim. It's, well, it's not, yeah. at least not just a victim. There well, were also <laughs> mis mistakes made. I mentioned them in my talk. So there needs to be a fair point, and Greece has done tremendous hard work. That's also true. Yeah. So, no, I agree that Greece did, certainly didn't do any, everything perfectly. In fact, that, you know, it had a lot of problems before. Uh, one of my concerns, or actually two of my concerns, is that some of the so-called troika, uh, troika tax reforms were very peculiar. For instance, requiring small businesses to pay their taxes a year ahead of time. 
in a context of a financial market that's not functioning. So what that meant is that they, they basically couldn't do that. And so uh, it, it, it really took away the little capital and had a very depressing effect. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 there were other aspects of their um, uh, reforms. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that Papandreou had tried to do was curtail the linkage between the oligarch banks and the media. And when he was pushed out in 2011, partly out of resistance to their wanting to, ha Papandreou wanted to have a referendum to get the Greek people behind. He thought he was going to get the referendum succeed, passed, but they didn't want to allow him to go to the people. And so it was, uh, uh, at, and at that moment he left office. Those kinds of reforms that were trying to attack the oligarchs uh, were short-circuited by the next government that was part of the government that had originally overspent the money and was closely linked with the oligarchs. And when that new oligarchic government came back in, not surprisingly, they let some of those reforms slip by and uh, uh, the, the Troika was, uh, didn't, didn't try to make sure that they, those kinds of reforms uh, were maintained. Okay, a question from the floor because this yeah, person my question standing was here from a while back, but I think it's quite topical in the discussion you were just having. Um, I'm, I was trying to reconcile the two stories. Um, I think where you very much agree is that um, it is basically national institutions that, that matter for, for growth in the end. Um, what, I'm, what I'm wondering if, is if the big difference is not that Mr. Dijsselbloem actually believes that the Euro project helps to um, discipline countries to get these reforms, whereas Mr. Stiglitz very sharply says, I do not believe in conditionality and in the idea that there could be disciplining from countries from like some kind of larger project like the European, uh, like the Euro. So I guess my question maybe is to Mr. Stiglitz, looking to the future, is there a way you can see that the Euro could actually help bring about these um, reforms that are domestically needed to make the larger project a success? Yeah, so first, there's one more point I, I say, is that the Euro represents a constraint on what countries can do. Uh, it takes away, as I said, one of the most important, two of the most important instruments, the exchange rate and the interest rate. And the question is, does it put other things at the disposal that enable the countries to, to, to work more effectively? And I'm not convinced that it, that it did, that it put more constraints than it provided assistance. Uh, on, the, on the particular question, of are there things that it could do to uh, help promote uh, uh, economic reforms? I think the, the big lesson is, uh, uh, as I said, that we've learned at the World Bank was uh, you cannot impose reforms from the outside. And when you do, you get resentment. Uh, and it's very hard from the outside to know the right pace, the right uh, sequencing, uh, the right institutional details to make them work. And uh, the history of those kinds of reforms is, is almost always uh, bad. And so there needs to be a discussion. Mr. Dijsselboom, do you agree? N no, I don't. I don't think, I don't think um, uh, the people at the World Bank would agree. The World Bank has a lot of experience and knowledge on the design, the implementation, getting the order right of reforms, especially in building institutions. And in a country like Greece, institutions have to be built, sometimes rebuilt, but sometimes built. Uh, having a register for uh, land, uh, the Dutch have been trying to help, it still isn't uh, in place. Uh, rebuilding the tax system, making sure that there is a fair tax base for everyone. Um, this is institution building and outside help can help and sometimes, you know, I'm a national politician, sometimes outside pressure can help. Of course the big issue is here, how far can you go in terms of democratic legitimacy? 
And that question becomes even more difficult when a country is in a program. A country asks the community to, to provide very cheap loans, uh, to take on, therefore, a part of their risk. The loan may not come back. Uh, and then the community can say, well, we will borrow you money, and we've borrowed Greece vast amounts, very low price, very long maturity periods, but you need to sort out some of your problems. And in the debate between Greece, people think that it is all designed by the Troika. The Troika is like the devil. They come in and they tell you what to do. These are long and detailed negotiations about labor market reforms, pension market reforms, about the timing. I spent many nights in Brussels talking with Prime Minister Tsipras and ministers of finance, different ministers of finance, on the design, <laughs> the order, the depth, uh, the combination of reforms. So, uh, but yes, outside pressure is important in these situations. Can I just say, I think sharing of experiences is important. I think uh, the notion that there can be free and open negotiations between a debtor who's on his deathbed and a creditor is a fantasy. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's, it's uneven. It's uneven, and yet... Um, you cannot, here I agree with Professor Stiglitz, you cannot do it from the outside. It needs to be done in the end by politicians, by administrations, by institutions but in are you Greece. Saying, are you saying that all the policies imposed upon Greece were policies that the Greek wanted? It very much depends on you who you are. So that will be my first point. <laughs> because many of the reforms hit on vested interests. So the Greek economy is very much protected. Many oligarchs, monopolies, uh, regional monopolies, uh, and there are very strong interest groups linked to the politicians, making sure that their interests are the same. Is that in the interest of Greek citizens? Is it in the interest of Greek citizens that for many consumer products or medicines, the prices in Greece are extremely high? And this was before the Euro crisis. It had to do with the way the economy was organized. So, were some of these reforms very unpopular? Were the tractors in the street? Of course they were. Was a new government elected that opposed these policies? Was there a referendum Indeed. that overturned these a policies? A government, that, a political party that went to the electorate and said, vote for us and the problems will go away. Is that a fair proposition to the electorate? I don't think so. I think that the least uh, a political party should do, but we have a strong tradition here in the Netherlands, make sure that what you have on offer is realistic and affordable. Uh, and that was far from the case in that particular election in Greece. Oh yes, we have questions. I want to ask one more question about Greece, because um, in your book you say Mr. Varoufakis, the finance minister we all know, um, <laughs> Was an, is an excellent economist and probably the only real economist among the finance ministers of Europe. <laughs> Mr. Well, Dijsselbloem, maybe, how do you agree? Okay. <laughs> well, he was maybe the only one who had been a professor of economics is really what I meant to say. I, didn't, I, I maybe overspoke. <laughs> I'll acknowledge that. I'll acknowledge that. But you have to realize that part of the problem was that with exactly that attitude, Mr. Farofakis came into the room. <laughs> And if you want to build a relationship with your colleagues, certainly when you're in a very bad spot and you need their help, to come in the room and to say, I'm the only one who understands economics is not a good approach. <laughs> we have two questions, please. Yes, Mr. Dessenblum, you remarked earlier about how uh, local shocks can be buffered by having labor move abroad to other regions in, for instance, Europe. Now, we've seen that happen regionally, say, Drenthe in Holland, or maybe Zeeland. How, how, are you, how are we going to solve the problem of the brain drain? How are we going to turn that around? How are we going to have Greece not starting to be the end of Europe? Yeah. Have, have talented people move back there eventually or have talented people stay there now? Yeah. Um, I'll give you one example. I studied at the University of Cork in the southwest of Ireland in the 90s. The situation in Ireland then was economically very poor and all the students, my fellow students, were talking about immigration. Not whether they were going to immigrate, but where to. And some were going to Germany, some were going to Australia, to the US. This was the situation in Ireland then. After that, of course, there was a huge boom in the economy. And in that period, many of those students, some of which I stayed in touch with, 
came back to Ireland. Uh, so here, Ireland, which it has to do with the fact that it's an open econom economy, it's, uh, it's a small economy, but it has shown that it is much more flexible in reacting to economic cycles. I hope for Ireland that they manage the economic cycle much better in the future, that it won't keep going boom and bust. But the flexibility of having um, a well-trained population that is also prepared to work in Germany for some years and in the good years go back to Ireland will be part of Europe's future as it, this is how it works also in the US. Yeah, but okay, there, there is a difference, I think. And I, I think the reality is that while some come back, a lot of them don't. And there is a process of howling out that is going on in Portugal and, and Greece and, and, and Spain, and it will have long-run consequences. I think that is the reality. Okay, thank you. We have three more questions in five minutes, so. Hello, I'm Francis from Rethinking Economics, and I think uh, a key issue that we've experienced in the last year is that people don't fully understand the economic debate that we're having right here. So my question to you two is, how can we democratize the economic debate so that more people can understand it? Wow. Um, good point. <laughs> Difficult question. <laughs> You're a politician, you're supposed to be able to answer questions like that. <laughs> yeah. But I also think that even politicians should get the moment to think for at least 10 seconds before answering. So my answer would be that this debate is all over Europe now, and I try to participate in it everywhere. So Tracy made the joke that I, she was glad that I'm still here after the interview in the uh, Financial Dagblad. I had absolutely no reason not to come because this is a real debate. This is going on and I participate also in this debate in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece. I go to universities and discuss with students these debates, exactly these topics. They may not like me always, they may not agree with me always, but I think that is what politicians need to do. And too often we make decisions, major decisions behind closed doors. So where the Eurogroup is concerned, I'm also trying to open that up, publishing, um, how do you call it, reports of our meetings, uh, uh, publishing the agenda in advance. But we also need to reach out and have the public debate, and we need to be part of it. Uh, it shouldn't just be between the public and the economists. Uh, the politicians should be here, and that's why I'm here. Go ahead. Yes, just a quick question while we're on the issues of divergence and some of the issues disproportionately facing countries such as Greece. Um, there's been no mention of the refugees this evening, and I was wondering whether you wanted to share some thoughts on whether that poses an additional shock to the system. Is that an additional barrier to creating more Europe and less divergence? Mr. Stiglitz. Yeah, I think there actually is a relationship between the Euro and the refugee issue in the following sense. That uh, because what I've described as uh, the Euro not functioning well, creating this divergence, the consequence of that is that there are a few countries where the unemployment rate is relatively low and many countries where the unemployment rate is very high. The migrants don't want to go to countries where there's high unemployment, and those countries with high unemployment are particularly uh, unhappy about having more people seeking jobs when there are already so few jobs. The result of this is that inevitably there will be disproportionate burden sharing, or what will be viewed as disproportionate burden sharing. The migrants will go to a relatively few countries, and those countries will wind up resenting it. The other issue where it's linked is uh, we were talking about the uh, common issues of sharing the burden of unemployment, a period episode of high unemployment. Uh, there are similar issues of the particular burdens where the unemployment, where the migrants land, uh, uh, land. They, they land in Greece and they land in, in Italy. And, uh, the rules of Europe say that those are the countries where the, you know, uh, they're supposed to be dealt with first. But that's an unfair burden sharing. Uh, 
So the question is, if Europe is going and the Eurozone uh, are going to work, there has to be a sense, uh, a broader sense of burden sharing than uh, has existed so far. Do you agree, yes or no? Very short. Is that all I can say? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I was going to disagree with the first part, but here, here again, it was the euro getting the blame for the migration issue, and you cannot blame everything on the euro. I don't think that's... It wasn't for the migration existing. It's where they want to go, and that when there are big differences in unemployment, they are going to want to go to those countries where this is true, the employ but this uh, is unemployment rate is low. Uh, but that would be exactly the same if we didn't have the euro. That would be my point. Also then, in Europe, migrants will go to the area where the opportunities are best. And look at the US, it's exactly the same. Migrants will go to there where they find that they could get a job. I think there's another parallel, which is probably more important. We tend to build Europe by taking big steps but never finishing the job, never completing what we've built. And our migration rules uh, and uh, framework is one of these examples. Like the Euro, we, didn't, we, we started the Euro, but we didn't have all the institutions and the frameworks, we didn't think of it. Migration is the same, because you're quite right, the Dublin Treaty isn't functioning. It's putting the burden on the countries where the migrants enter, and that doesn't work. It has, it has failed. We opened up the internal borders, taking away the internal borders, but didn't think of who's going to protect and regulate the outside borders. So that was the parallel I thought of. In the way we deal with migration, we tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. We start a project, do it half, don't finish it until we get in a crisis, and then we start finishing it. Clear. So, Last question. Unfortunately. Hello. Uh, my name is Viva, and this question is mostly focused on uh, Mr. Dijsselbloem, I was really wondering if you knew about all the corruption and internal problems in Greece, why did you accept them to the European Union? And it, it metaphorically it really made me think of like, this is not a very good metaphor, but the Nazis, they wanted to expand too quickly. And if this happens to Europe, it's going to collapse after a while and well, History shouldn't oh, repeat itself. Uh, <laughs> thank God the Nazi collapses. Um, yeah. So I'll leave the metaphor there. Um, but I think you, you, your question is right. It's going back to the start of the project. Um, if you allow countries to enter the monetary union who are far apart in terms of where they are institutionally, economically, or even politically, um, that is very difficult and risky. Uh, there were some criteria, but they weren't, partly they weren't taken serious, partly the figures were fraud, fraud uh, the, the, they were wrong, incorrect, fraud, um, and partly I think the criteria weren't right. So in the last couple of expansions of the Eurozone, when the Baltic states became a member, we also looked at the structure of their economy. We also looked at risks in their financial sector. So we took a more in-depth look of the risks of these new countries joining us and didn't just look at the old criteria which were not good enough and uh, were not upheld. So there was a, uh, I think part of the true story is also this at the beginning, uh, a group of country was selected that uh, already brought in some major risks. Okay, the last remarks are for Miss Tracy Metz. Closing remarks for this evening. Well, my closing remark is a huge word of thanks to both Joseph Stieglitz and to Jeroen Dijsselbloem for joining us and for breaking open our minds in this way with a whole new perspective on the Euro and the Euro project and where it's taking us and where we want it to go to the extent that we have anything to say about that. <laughs> if you want to keep up with what we do, Sign up for our newsletter and then you and all your friends will know that this event was going to happen and we wouldn't be having phone calls every two minutes from people desperately trying to find tickets. So sign up for our newsletter. The mission of the John Adams is to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. And I think this evening has been a shining example. I would like to ask one last thing before we go. Can I have a show of hands? Professor Stiglitz has suggested that maybe we should abandon the Euro project after all. Who is for leave? <laughs>
And who is for Remain? Well, what do you say to that? Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our sponsor, Geetronics, for making this wonderful event possible and for supporting the good work of the John Adams. We really appreciate it. And Professor Stieglitz will be signing uh, the Dutch edition of his book published by Ateneum. The books are on sale here. The signing will be in the library at the back of the hall and then to the right. Tell everybody you know about all the wonderful things that we do. Come back soon. Bring a friend. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.